The Prime Minister has two weeks to convince the country and MPs to back her plan to exit the EU. But many of the capital's politicians aren't at all happy with her plan and told her so today in the Commons. Our political correspondent Simon Harris is in Westminster this evening. Simon, who said what then? Uh, Nina, London MPs lined up today to give Mrs May's Brexit deal a good kicking. She told them they faced a choice. We can back this deal, deliver on the vote of the referendum and move on to building a brighter future of opportunity and prosperity for all our people. Or this House can choose to reject this deal and go back to square one. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, quickly dismissed that argument. The Prime Minister says if we reject this deal, it will take us back to square one. The truth is, Mr Speaker, under this government, we've never got beyond square one. Yeah. <laughs> Many of the attacks came from Mrs May's own side. Putney's Justine Greening spoke of false promises from Leavers and Remainers. How can the Prime Minister reassure the House that this debate we're about to have now on her deal is based on facts and evidence and not more false promises? The former London Mayor Boris Johnson opened his attack with a little sarcasm. I congratulate my, my right honourable friend on beginning her campaign to sell this deal to the country with the frank admission just now that it is unsatisfactory. That, he said, was a bit of an understatement. Essex MP Mark Francois opted for passion. I plead with you, the House of Commons has never, ever surrendered to anybody and it won't start now. Can the Prime Minister get her deal past MPs, um, what will happen if she doesn't? That seemed to be behind this question from Marsha Dakova, the Battersea Labour MP. What is her plan B when this deal inevitably falls? On the evidence of today's debate, Mrs May has got a long way to go to convince MPs, a majority of MPs, that this deal is worth more than the paper it's written on. Nina. Simon Harris, thank you. The ticket resale site Viagogo, which sells tickets to hundreds of gigs and events around London, was told by a court today to change the way it does business. It's been accused of flouting consumer laws by selling some fans invalid tickets at vastly inflated prices. And some artists, including Ed Sheeran, have begun blocking entry to their concerts. While our correspondent Simon Harris is here. Simon, this seems like a significant development. Yes, many of Viagogo's customers who use the site to buy tickets for concerts, festivals and sporting events say they've had a terrible experience. The hidden booking fee and VAT can come as a horrible surprise and that can be the least of their problems. It's something we've been reporting on for several months. Well, today, the Competition and Markets Authority won a court ruling which orders Viagogo to change its business methods. The High Court says Viagogo must tell buyers they may be turned away, must provide information about the ticket seller, and it must not mislead customers over the popularity of tickets. We've seen heartbreaking cases of families who've saved up to go to big concerts or big events, who've paid for their travel across the country, and then they've got to the entrance and found that their ticket isn't valid. This means that they will know whether the ticket's valid or not as soon as they pay for it. Viagogo has until mid-January to obey the court order. Now, the campaign group uh, organisation Fanfare, which is backed by the music industry, would rather Viagogo was shut down altogether. They haven't shown themselves to be the most trustworthy in how they've dealt with consumers, artists, the public. They haven't turned up to select committees. They've had several years of not complying with consumer law, uh, while their competitors have slowly started to do that. So I, I think we're sort of reserving judgment until middle of the middle of January when we see what happens. Well, tonight, Via Gogo issued a statement describing the judgment as an agreement which will provide even greater transparency. That came as a surprise to the market and competition. The Competition and Markets Authority said, which said, it's not an agreement, it's a ruling. And if Via Gogo doesn't obey it by mid January, it'll be in danger of breaking the law and could risk a fine. All right, Simon, thank you.
How many times have politicians promised to get tough on knife crime? Well, today, one of them, the mayor, accused the law of not doing it either. Sadiq Khan hit out at a judge for not sending a teenager to prison for lashing out at a man with what's called a zombie knife. The attack in April was filmed on a dash cam. The boy, Joshua Gardner, was sentenced yesterday. But today, the mayor says he should have been jailed and the case has now been referred to the Attorney General. Our correspondent, Simon Harris, has the details. We're going to get rid of uh, dangerous people and dangerous weapons. We should have zero tolerance towards uh, people carrying uh, knives. And you will face the full force of the law. Unless, of course, your name is Joshua Gardner. This dash cam video shows the teenager laying into a car with a zombie knife. His vicious attack in Thornton Heath in South London was there for all to see. But despite such compelling evidence, he wasn't sent to jail. London's mayor doesn't normally criticise judges, but today made an exception. I've seen the video. I've seen the actions of this uh, young man uh, and the knife he used, and I was scared watching it. Uh, and I don't understand how somebody who uses a knife that way uh, is not in custody in, in prison. Gardner admitted a fray and possessing an offensive weapon. He denied attempting to cause grievous bodily harm, but was found guilty. Anuja Deer QC, the judge in his trial at the Old Bailey, could have sent him to prison. Instead, she gave him a suspended sentence, as well as ordering him to do unpaid community work. A message like this, where you're saying you don't get a custodial sentence for carrying a zombie knife, is absolutely absurd. This knife is bought for one reason and held by individuals for one reason, and it's to inflict damage to others, to harm others. It is an offensive weapon. London is in the grip of a murderous spike in violence, which has already claimed more than 100 lives this year. Recent changes to the law are supposed to mean harsher sentences for anyone carrying a knife. Anyone who uses one to threaten a victim should go to jail for at least six months. Joshua Gardner got off lightly. Gardner's relief at avoiding jail might be short-lived. Today, the Office of the Attorney General announced it was reviewing the suspended sentence and could refer it to the Court of Appeal. Joshua Gardner didn't want to talk to us today. He didn't want to answer the question being asked by many Londoners. What do you have to do to get locked up? Look, the mayor is clearly unhappy with Joshua's sentence, but judges, they have different priorities sometimes, don't they? Yeah, Sadiq Khan says he doesn't normally criticise court cases or judges because unless you're in the court, you don't know the full story. But as a politician, he's under pressure to do something about violence. The public want the politicians to do something. Politicians, the police and anti-violence campaigners all seem to think that tougher sentences are a deterrent. The judges, of course, are part of an independent judiciary. They have different rules. They do things in a different way. Now, Joshua Gardner, this was not his first offence, so that alone should have qualified him automatically for a minimum six-month jail sentence. But the judge took into account the fact that he had also been the victim of violence. He was apparently kidnapped and held at gunpoint, threatened with a gun, over a friend's uh, drug death. So she took that into account when she decided not to jail him. Now, of course, judges don't answer to the court of public opinion. Mm. But in this case, this judge now finds that there is an online petition calling for her to be sacked. Simon Harris, thank you. A nine-month delay to Crossrail has already cost Transport for London hundreds of millions of pounds. And now we're being warned it could put a stop to vital upgrades to the Tube too. A report from the credit rating agency Moody's says the delay has wiped out any profit the new service would have made for TfL over the next few years and warns any further issues could cause serious financial problems. Our political correspondent Simon Harris has the details. This is not how it was meant to be. The new Crossrail station at Paddington should be a sparkling monument to a triumph of engineering. Instead, it's a building site with many months of work still to do. The original plan was for Crossrail to be ready in 10 days' time, but the official opening by the Queen has been shunted into the future and passengers have been told the first train won't arrive until next autumn. The postponed royal opening isn't just a huge political embarrassment, it's an expensive one. The delay is going to cost Londoners hundreds of millions of pounds. And it could lead to the cancellation of much needed improvements to the tube. Today's report from the credit rating agency Moody's says Crossrail is critical to Transport for London's financial future. The revenue from fares will make up 12% of TfL's income. But because of the delay, there'll be a shortfall of £400 million by 2021. 
East London MP Meg Hillier chairs the Commons Public Accounts Committee. She's investigating Crossrail and is worried Londoners will have to foot the entire bill. This was a jointly sponsored project between Department for Transport and TfL, so it's important that both parties step up and make sure that this is dealt with. It shouldn't be that Londoners have to bail out what's happened with Crossrail because it is a benefit to the country as a whole. Even before the Crossrail shambles, TfL's finances were in a mess. The organisation is almost a billion pounds short of what it needs, thanks to a combination of fewer passengers, government cuts and the Mayor's partial fares freeze. All eyes are now on next month's TfL business plan to see what major improvement schemes will become casualties. Unfortunately, projects like the Bakerloo Line extension, Crossrail 2, they're being pushed further and further back as there isn't the cash to develop those projects, let alone fund them going into the long term. But TfL's finances are in a really poor position and the Mayor has got to look at a number of things, including his fares policy. Tonight, Transport for London said it was working with the Mayor and Ministers to finalise a financing package. In other words, another bailout for Crossrail. Simon, uh, this delay clearly causing problems for TfL. Um, you've been trying to get to the bottom of what the Mayor knew about this delay. I know you've been trying to put some questions to him. You finally got your chance. Are we any wiser now? On September the 12th, City Hall promised that the Crossrail Board minutes would be made public. More than two months on, they still haven't. Now, Sadiq Khan insists that he, he only found out that Crossrail wouldn't open on December the 9th at the end of August. Frankly, the London Assembly is astonished that the man who chairs Transport for London didn't know sooner. We do know that the Mayor was briefed by the Crossrail Chairman, Sir Terry Morgan, on July the 26th. So I asked Sadiq Khan what he was told about possible delays. I'm quite clear. It was only late in the day in, in August that I was told uh, that the uh, central section of the Crossrail uh, line uh, would be delayed until autumn uh, uh, next year. I've expressed my anger frustra and frustration. What were you told at that 26th of July meeting? Uh, I was given a number of different uh, options, uh, as is normal. Uh, you ask questions about which is more likely and which isn't. At no stage was I told by Crossrail Limited uh, that there'd be a delay until next autumn. Were you told uh, there might be a delay to the opening in December? Over the course of the last two years, uh, Cross Limited have expressed uh, concerns around costs, around scheduling. Can I be clear, were you told at that 26th of July meeting that there was a risk of a possible delay to the opening in December? There's been a number of occasions where we've been told there are concerns around the scheduling and the uh, costs. So that's a yes. Is... You were told on the 26th of July by Terry Morgan that the opening on December the 9th might not happen. No, what I'm saying is there are a number of options presented to us, not just in July, but over the last uh, two years in relation to costs and in relation to scheduling. The Mayor has promised that in the interests of transparency and learning lessons for the future, all relevant papers will be published. But like the opening of Crossrail, we still don't know when. Mm, we don't. Simon, thank you.